I don't want to give the impression that it's like I'm trying as super as hard as I can to yeah. squeeze every dollar as possible from comics. I'm just and trying I'm, to say that you're not unique right? in that respect. I mean, it it's, seems right. very difficult. I'm just saying, I, I, yeah, one shouldn't make general general conclusions sure. from my from yeah. my particular experience because I'm a weird person, you know, with my own weird life you were trying to do it professionally at that point right ostensibly what does that mean i mean i know what the word (laughs) ostensibly means but what does it mean in this context i guess what i'm saying is i could have worked harder i probably could have i turned down things i turned down things all the time you know what i mean so it's when you turn down something it's and then complain about not making money it's maybe not right yeah like if i took every job and worked 14 hours a day and then I still had a hard time making money then I could maybe conclude that this is very you, you, you're saying you I can't, feel like I'm belaboring it no I, I think you're saying that you can't both have principles and complain about not making money well like, I don't know that if, it, if you're trying to in earnest make money you need to just kind of do what's off, on offer right but I don't know that it's principles either like okay. I'm like turning down what are you turning down um, things I don't want to do well, what, sorts, what sorts of offers is Kevin Hines saying at getting that he's not doing? <laughs> um, it even it might even be something that actually I probably should have taken. I'm okay. just bad at making decisions. I see. Or so, you know, a particular thing comes along, and I'm like, uh, I don't. You know, it's working on a project like a book uh, about something, yeah. or, or working with some company or some nonprofit that wants to do some kind of like nonfiction comics kind of thing. And it's like I kind of maybe would like to do that, mm-hmm. but not for. <laughs> For more money, you know, or yeah. maybe I just I actually want to work on my own book for a while, and I'm just going to turn that down, even though it's maybe a better idea to take that. So timing, <laughs> yeah, timing. Ganges isn't something you feel like you could maybe do for a living necessarily. I, I never thought of it that way, yeah. or tried to turn it into that kind of thing. You tried to do comics for a living. You were also just kind of doing them for yourself. Yeah, I don't know. I mean. I guess I haven't didn't make smart career moves sure. is what I'm saying, you know. Yeah. Or, but I, I didn't even like sit down and think. It's hard to explain. I mean, you clearly enjoy the, the process of doing it. I, yeah, I love drawing comics. Yeah. It's uh, when I started drawing comics when I was younger. It, it's all I ever wanted to do. Come up with ideas, work on them. For whatever reason, I came up during a time that I was influenced by punk DIY ideas about making comics. I think that affected me in such a way, not that I became a Mm -hmm. punk DIY person. It more affected me in a way where I was like, I'm just not even going to think about this in terms of success and career. For better, for worse. That's the way that my mind has developed such that... and And it's hurt my career. It's hurt my ability to make money. But instead, instead, I just think about comics that I want to do and I work on them and then I more or less react to circumstances around me you know an interesting conversation that I have with musicians a lot particularly bands who came up through the punk community right as you get older you start to realize like some of your viewpoints were maybe kind of arbitrary I mean that's happened to me a lot where I'm just like I don't know why that was something I was holding on to for so long. I don't know why there were certain things that I refused to do because they didn't feel in line with whatever that you know ethos I had when I was younger. You just kind of hold on to things subconsciously for, for years, it seems. Yeah, it's a constant struggle to figure out what the truth is, <laughs> what's right, what's yeah. the right principles, what's the, what's the right uh, combination of principle and action, you know, who are the right friends to have, who are the right um, people to date. It's very, it's tricky, and uh, life throws things at you, and you make the best decision you can at the moment that you find yourself, and then you look back sometimes, and you think, huh. Is there anything you look back at that you had turned down at the time that you wished you had taken? No idea. I don't even think like that. It's not, I don't think it's healthy. useful or healthy to, yeah. to have, spend a moment on regret, if you can help it. I get the feeling reading interviews with you that comics were... I don't want to say an uncomfortable fit, but as a storytelling form, it was something that you you kind of struggled with, at least in sort of a more like linear storytelling fashion. I don't think I struggled with comics uh, in that way. I think I maybe struggled with storytelling in general. I often wanted to to write about ideas or non-fictional, essayistic sort of things. But then at the same time, I also loved a story 
that just felt effortless of when a character just starts their day and they run into another person and then that turns into a thing and then you know that sort of like effortless hypnotic natural storytelling and so for whatever reason i wanted to try to combine the two the effortless feel of everyday life things just sort of happening without too much like strict plotting you know three act structure artificial plotting artificial like cliched setup where you're like oh i'm meeting this character this character is going to come back Mm -hmm. you know or this is the person i'm supposed to like because they're petting the cat and this is the person who kicks the cat so i don't you know that kind of at the same time it's like i wanted to write like i want to write about chlorophyll or something like that you know i'm much more interested in thinking about chlorophyll or plant structure or urban planning or something like that while at the same time wanting to to show like the frustrations of doing the laundry or finding a weird bug in your house you know what i mean did those feel like a natural fit at first or did you kind of have to jam them together when you were first starting i think when i was first starting uh, i was just into superheroes and then when i came across the work of john porcelino uh there mini comics of adrian tomine even something like cerebus when i came across that stuff and realized that you could do all these different literary things with comics literary meaning what does literary mean in comics i guess it means something like not a a genre story about good guys versus bad guys or even a genre story about like will they won't they make out the freedom of literary writing Mm -hmm. i guess is what the fact that there was a way to entertain both of these things that you wanted to do in the same place yeah i mean uh literary nonfiction, literary i mean lyrical poetry epic poetry all those different forms uh that are available to literature you could fit all of that in comics and then you can also do all these effects with comics where you can show things unfolding visually you can show things unfolding on the page it's just more of a toolbox for storytelling effects <clears throat> i mean i also think about comics i think i'm a frustrated i'm a frustrated musician like i'm i never learned to play music other than a little bit of piano but i think that i think in terms of music in an abstract way and i think when I think about comics, I'm thinking about it unfolding like music, and I'm thinking about the possibilities of comics as almost being like the possibilities of the studio, of the equipment, of the instruments and stuff like that. Like, what if I mix this with this, or mm-hmm. if I adjust the volume, or adjust the room tone, or all these kind of different things towards some musical effect using the comics. The early interviews with Chris Ware, where Chris Ware would talk about comics as music, were very highly influential on, on me in high school and i think i've i still think that way all the time about comics when i think about music in that way i'm I'm thinking kind of in terms of like a studio right in in terms of post-production in terms of raising and lowering levers on different instruments but comics have to be more scripted right i mean these are decisions that you're kind of making ahead of time maybe the best comics i've done or even the longest comics i've done have started out as uh, me just drawing one panel and not knowing where it's going. But then a couple pages in, I, it all starts unfolding, you know. But I don't sit, I use. I don't think about it before I sit down. Like, for instance, uh, Gloriana started with me drawing Glenn and his wife unloading the groceries mm-hmm. from the car, and Wendy was pregnant. And then it just went from there, and it ended up with the moon illusion, and it ended up with diagrams and all this kind of science research and stuff like that. But I didn't, have that, I didn't have that planned when I drew the first panel. If all the material that's in the river at night, that started with me drawing Glenn pouring himself coffee mm. uh, in the middle of the first chapter. And then it just, like, things spread out from there. I don't... I'm reacting to your question about planning it out, like music. Gotta hate to use this because it's overused, but, like, jazz in that same sense where you've got some, some sort of foundation... <laughs> And then you're letting it kind of explore and branch out from there. Yeah, it's it's a, a mixture of improvising and a mixture of structure. I think in the best way, as an artist or as a writer, you have to always be improvising what you're doing, while also being conscious of like the classical structures of threes or the structure of like building from quiet to loud, loud to quiet. The the classical structures of development. You know that some that things can intertwine and then develop. In that book specifically, River at Night, 
there weren't specific beats that you wanted to hit along the way. It really just started with a single image and branched out from there. It started with the first issue, and it ended with Glenn in bed and unable to sleep. I remember taking a walk and thinking, like, this moment of Glenn being in bed and not able to sleep. I had this idea that I could work. I could. That's that's it. I could do that for the rest of my life. I could just do stories that always started with Glenn in bed, not being able to sleep, and then I could go in all these different directions from there. And I, it, I as a joke almost to myself, I thought, I really could just do this for the rest of my career. I could yeah. be the guy who does the stories about the guy who can't sleep, but then I could go anywhere. I could go, you know, he could get up and he could look at old photographs, and before you know it, you're in World War II, or, or so, you know what I mean? Anywhere I wanted to go, I could go there, but it would always come back to this one. So I don't think that that's what I'm going to do for the rest of my life, but it's at least it's what I did for the this book. But then the, the things that I ended up writing about, like Glenn reading a book or Glenn going to the library, those suggested other things and those suggested other things. So the book ended up being about more than just, you know, a bunch of forays into mm-hmm. different stories that are all unified by Glenn being in bed. It ended up being about his marriage and about time and geology and deep time and reading books and all these different things. And then once those started developing, I felt like I could develop those into their own little, almost like little ecosystems of yeah. story. And then at a certain point, I just, I needed to wrap it up and make it a book. So then I had to think about how to kind of unify it. And But that's that's kind of the a story of how the, the thing organically unfolds from without a, a pre-existing plan. The difficulty in it is is finding a place to end it, essentially, to neatly wrap it up. Yeah, the difficulties and the, the total joys of it is working with the forms once they're created and unfolding. And then, I don't know, there's this George Saunders essay recently, I think about all the time, where he talks about the writer having a little gauge on their forehead, and it's just like, it's always just like, it's either going a little towards yes or a little towards no, and you're just like hypersensitive to that gauge. And so as you, like, make little changes or make little adjustments to the thing, it's just, like, the gauge is either, like, telling you, like, yes, keep going this way or no, no, don't go this way. And then you just try to make it all work. There must be times when you've followed the rabbit too far down a hole that didn't... Oh, for sure. For sure. And I created all kinds of pages that I cut from the book or I I went down a few dead ends that wasted a lot. You know, I don't know if they wasted time. It's just It's just the way it went. And that's that's one of the hard decisions of making a thing is that at a certain point, yeah, you have to look it up. You know, like anybody, like movie makers, anything, you got to cut scenes, you got to cut, and some of that stuff, I still have sitting around, and I'll try to do something with it. It seems especially tough if you're actually working that on a paper, if you're actually doing the drawing, right? I mean, you're spending, you're investing yeah. a lot more of yourself into it. It's awful. <laughs> no, you can, you could. I've spent, you know, it takes. Sometimes it takes a. At, at its best, it takes a week to make a page. Mm. Sometimes it often takes two weeks to make a page. If you go down four pages and then you change your mind, it might be a month and a half's worth of work that you, it, you know, that's a hard decision after a month and a half to be like, this month and a half, I'm just going to, yeah. I'm just going to ditch this. And I've done, you know, I've had to do a lot. I've, yeah, months of work went into the fifth chapter that I ended up cutting. Uh, and even at the time, I, I followed these certain dead ends, drew a lot of pages, drew a lot of thumbnail. I don't really draw the whole finished page. If it gets to the finished page, that's probably in the book. Yeah. But there's a lot of in-between stages before the finished page, and a lot of that stuff ends up in dead, you know, going down dead ends. I always wonder about whether to publish that stuff. I probably will publish that stuff because it's like, it's something something that I can exchange for goods and services for yeah. money, you know, anyways. I think a lot about that scene in Crumb with the brother who has a sketchbook that just gets, like, progressively more and more abstract as he goes along. Yeah. Do you, do you ever feel yourself kind of maybe yeah. heading in that direction? Yeah. No, a few years ago, when early in my career, if I did work on paper, it tended to be something that was going to go into a mini-comic yeah. or a book. At a certain point, I started down a path of being a notebook person and a notebook scribbler and it was sort of good for a while because it like I used it as a focus object almost mm-hmm. to like be like I don't know what to do I don't know what to focus on but I can sit down with this one notebook and I'll just like focus here for a while I definitely have now a lot of notebooks that are full of stuff that's not publishable yeah. and so I'm trying to find a way back to not spending all my time in notebooks uh, with stuff that's 
not going anywhere. <laughs> is it a lot of kind of diagrammatic drawings? My notebooks have way more words in them than they have oh, interesting. pictures. There's a lot of pages that is just all words. Or there's a lot of pages where it's kind of like a mixture of words and boxes and words in box, you know, little paragraphs in boxes and thoughts in boxes. There's a lot of my notebooks, too, that are sort of like thoughts and then a line and then that branches off and then that branches off. There's a lot of that stuff. And I've been looking at that recently, too, and trying to think, like, can I publish this? Can I make make something out of this? I was talking to somebody the other day and saying that, because um, I'm at a little, at a, at a little crossroads mm-hmm. in my career, and they were talking about, uh, going back to school, grad school, and I was saying that like I read books and take notes for fun, like every day. So like I was starting to realize maybe that's something that I should try to do professionally because I, I'm doing it for fun, anyways. How do you? Wait, so what I'm, do you mean professionally? I, I mean, getting paid for it, I guess. No, I, well, no, I understand that, but how do you translate taking a lot of notes into something you get paid for? It's a good question. Yeah, working on it. I mean, you're you, you're teaching, teaching. Is that That's scratch, that doesn't scratch that itch? Teaching is standing up in front of people yeah. and managing their projects and trying to keep people focused on their projects. And but it is taking learnings and finding ways to distill it and to impart that on to people. Ostensibly, <laughs> yeah. No, a lot of a lot of times, what you're doing is you're managing people's projects and you're helping them. Yeah. Stay on focus. You're trying to keep them from having emotional breakdowns about their work. You're trying to impart a lot of knowledge, but I'd say that's a much lower percentage of the job than you might mm-hmm. think. So what are you teaching right now? I'm not teaching right now okay. anything. What were you, what I were was you teaching, teaching comics. You were teaching comics. Yeah. There's a school in Minneapolis, MCAD, that has a yeah. comics program, four-year major program. I was talking to Lauren Weinstein about this, about how much teaching comics needs to be kind of a, kind of a trade school and how much you need to kind of prep people for the harsh realities of doing it professionally well, yeah and there's different ways of teaching comics like uh, people who, who teach comics some people teach graphic novels in an english department mm-hmm. some people teach non-comics majors like their fr- this is your first experience making a comic right and some people teach like young people who want to make comics their career and work in the industry and there's a there's a, a big difference between those approaches the people who teach young cartoonists how to get a job in the industry uh yeah it's it's hard where did you fall on that spectrum it's primarily a, well at mcad that's what it, it was a four-year comics program uh, i always i always was try to re, try to be realistic about that i approach comics more like a poet and therefore and poets don't there's not exactly a poetry industry that you can yeah. work your way up in yeah that I know about anyways, but like... Um, I think there's probably maybe two people in the world who make a living as a professional poet right now. Yeah, and, then, and and that's my approach to comics. And so if you're teaching comics, meaning like getting, getting work for the big companies or mm-hmm. getting a big book deal, you know, that's a kind of a different thing. And we, we talked a lot about that too. But, you know, at the end of the day, what you're, what I thought I was teaching the students is the habits of of working and where to keep their focus. There's a lot of distractions to keep you from actually working on pages. And comics is just working on pages and pages and pages. That's really all you do all the time. You're just thinking about the pages that you're working on. And that's it. So time management is a big part of it. Time management is one of the words that is given to that idea of how to handle that kind of thing. But yeah, it's really just creating an environment around yourself and a, a set of habits and and really a set of like where to put your attention and then you just you just keep working on it you were teaching them the thing that you still sort of struggle with in a, in a way yeah i think we all yeah 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 i struggle with it in a way as well and i think uh and then the, the last part of the the cycle or the circuit is uh distributing your work to people around mm-hmm. you sending it out getting it published publishing it if and i think if the students put their attention on those things that's really all that you can worry about there's no other like secret trick and that's what i would try to explain yeah. to them like people are going to see your work and they're going to respond to it and they're going to write to you and want to publish you or they're not and if they're not then you try again you know then you spend another year working on a thing or do they go into it thinking they're going to find some life hack some some unlock some i don't know secret. i don't know i, th- I feel like some I, f- I f- you know and i feel feel like it's set up in such a way to be like we're going to give you secret knowledge 
And, and I guess we do give them tips and secret now. There is stuff that you learn along the way. There's not, I guess there's no shortcut. Sure. Do you find the process of, of teaching and working with them to be useful when it comes to your own work? I mean, at the very least, it's probably made you a little more analytical about what you do. I would say no, and I would say it's not useful to be analytical about the work I do. And in fact, uh, I think it made me less analytical for better reasons. I honestly think that a lot of the activity of like, oh, we need to be analytical, we need to be critical, we need to... I don't think that's actually useful. I think the more critical you are, the more analytical you are, you end up in a lot of dead ends and you end up in a lot of like spirals and unuseful just like chatter it's really just about making pages and creating work and then when you run into a problem when the little meter on your forehead is in the you know no 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 all the time then that's when you stop and you think like okay what's going on here like then you can analyze and figure it out and try to pull it apart but if anything acting like oh we need to be that way all the time Mm. that actually might get in the way of of happily producing work and just being very simple about it. Like I have to do, this is a simple story. I have to work on it for four months. If you analyze it and you get really critical about it, it might take you 12 months because you're like doubting yourself and you're thinking like, well, this cartoonist does it this way and this cartoonist does it this way. And what if I did this? And actually, you know, it's too much. Don't worry about it. Just do the thing. Or you would be inclined to give up too early on something because it's not going exactly the way that you had hoped. Right. I think that's the common, the common thing I see all the time is are people frustrated with that they're not doing anything. They're not getting the story done. They're not working on the project. They're overthinking it. So many students were overthinking it when, like I was saying, I think you you just got to start on a page and just start drawing some panels of people doing things. And then your mind will take the story in all kinds of interesting different directions. But it's like then you're actually like running down the hill already. Mm -hmm. And so you can just like run and steer while you're running down the hill. But I think if you... I'm just making up a metaphor on the sure, fly no, no, here. No. But you're, if you're, you're sitting down the hill, if you're sitting on top yeah. of the hill and you're trying to survey the land yeah. and just look all around you and try to figure out the best route down the hill and all that kind of stuff, I guess that sounds kind of useful. But you, you you end up spending a lot of time just sitting at the top of the hill looking around and you're not making work. Some of it's instinctual. Some of it, you know, you if you go down enough hills, you get better at going down hills. You, you can feel it as you're doing it. Right. And I th- also think, like, the part of your brain that is useful as an artist is not the part of your brain that is, like, critical, is, like, language-based, is, like, a lot of it is, like, you're working with a mysterious force that is n- that you have to kind of, like, you can't manage it, you, you or it just unfolds while you're working. And so you often you're just going to work and you're going to surprise yourself along the way. I think I'm very left-brained, you know, whatever how that works. <clears throat> and so I'm always trying to like lessen that part of my brain so that the other part can the mysterious part, the creative part can feel more comfortable to when I work on something for years, I might not fully understand what I'm doing. And that's the, the best way to be Hmm. working is when you don't really understand what you're doing and so the idea that you should critically like have mastery over conceptually understanding every little aspect of what you're doing that's not the way to go the way to go is to be like what seems weird and surprising and makes me feel good and feel alive like laugh a little bit and then just go down that direction are you able to be critical or is it helpful to be critical later like if you go back and look at your book are you able to sort of see what you did in the process yeah i mean i think of critic being critical in the same way as maybe like the way i think of being a historian like a you like you're understanding something from a high level and putting it all in its context so that you can sort of understand how things are connected or related or the genealogy between things but i don't know that it's useful for being creative you i mean clearly you have an appreciation for people who are able to do it there's a lot of that in the work there's a lot of the the historical and the scientific there's a lot of kind of distilling a lot of that information within the context of these stories yeah you you don't find it useful for your own process necessarily to be a historian but you are it's very useful to be a historian yeah i guess i'm leaning on the meaning of the word critical 
which is the way that like a lot of younger people or students think about it, where the, it's evaluative. Of where just you're saying, like, it this is good, it out. this is bad, sure. this is better, this is worse. Yeah. Especially as an artist, as a strong artist, you have a, have a strong sense of what you like and what you don't like. But you have to be careful to not apply that t- too much to yourself in a way that becomes counterproductive or neurotic. You know what I mean? Because to me, the problem of making a good or a bad comic is less important than the problem of making a comic at all. Like, the first thing I think you want to avoid is... is Self-defeat. Paralysis. And then once you get going, you obviously want to avoid making bad work. But if, if avoiding making bad work just puts you back into paralysis, then that's bad. Yeah, I guess I was using critical thinking in the sense of being... not Detached might not be the right word, because obviously you want to be invested in it. But you also sort of want to be able to kind of take a step back and and look at the work. If it's useful. And I think, and of course you're doing it naturally. If you have to force yourself to do it. I mean, the other aspect of critical thinking that I'm thinking about as we're talking is the idea that hopefully you love... You, you love what you're doing yeah. and you love the, the best aspects of work by others. And if you love that and you proceed by that as your guiding principle, that's better than some sort of idea of like a critic as a cold, calculating sorter sorting things mm-hmm. into boxes or categories. Was that self-critique, that paralysis, was that something that you struggled with early on? I think every I think every writer, yeah. every cr- critical, per- every uh, creative person, unless they're really like, you know, operating at some high Buddha level where they're just, everything's flowing good, is always struggling with like working and not working. You're working and then life throws some things at you and so you have to stop for a while and then you have to try to get the momentum going again and it's not working or I think that's one of the that's one of the main struggles. I mean are you interested in doing something that's straight science or straight history of serving the purpose of these books that you're reading and distilling but actually like being that work that straight nonfiction. Yeah, I, of being, I, of being I a book so, about yes. plants, sir. I think so, yeah, but what I, I'm, I talk about this sometimes. What I'm really afraid of is doing slideshow work where it's just a text and then the, the images are just slideshows of illustrations of the text. That's a kind of nonfiction comics that I don't want to do. And so I start with Glenn because I start with, well, like, here's this, it's a, here's this guy and he's mm-hmm. moving around through space and he's living his life and, you know, that kind of thing. And then if I take a detour into information or research or nonfiction, I want it to be in the context of, like, this is happening, ha- this is happening in the context of this human being who's living already and moving and stuff like that. There's a sense you get when you read your work that when it gets to a point where it's really, you know, it's a few pages of just full illustration or, you know, you you kind of like move completely out of his life or the narrative that you're really, that's kind of a point when you're firing on all cylinders, when you found this rich vein of information that you really want to go down. Yeah, I think, yeah, I want it to be a relationship between those those things. So then it becomes a, a relationship between, on the one hand, sort of a fictional story and the relationship to the, the nonfiction, and then there's it, it becomes some sort of third thing. I suppose there would be a way to do some kind of strict nonfiction where you would still be able to use the the tools of comics and and maybe like I'm thinking of something like um, Neuro Comic by uh, Matteo. I don't I don't know how to say his name. There's some nonfiction comics like uh, comics with insects mm-hmm. or comics with um, where the, it actually sort of tells a story. That's not really the right way to say this either. But it unfolds as comics, visual comics. Things are moving panel to panel. It's not just a slideshow. When you hit on it is when you find a, a human story. In the case of you know this book, it's the guy who discovers the, the um, geological layers. The first thing that you did that really grabbed me was... and, and it's a story I think about a lot since I live in New York is how they got all Shakespeare's birds and let them out in Central Park. Yeah, yeah. It's sort of finding the human element or finding a narrative as a way to frame this scientific discovery. That particular bit of information came from an Annie Dillard book about the starlings, about the guy who released the starlings in Central Park because it was a bird from Shakespeare. That kind of work that Annie Dillard writes is the same sort of thing where it's like a mixture of fact and history and fiction, and then it's grounded in an experience of the natural, like a 
a direct experience of the natural world, mm -hmm. like a direct experience of seeing a starling in the garbage, you know, eating garbage yeah. while the cars are driving around it or giant flocks of starlings above the farm fields and then connecting that to the history and the, the science. I mean, it's a perfect story from that standpoint, right? It's a perfect story from the standpoint of everybody having some sort of, some frame of reference for these birds and there being just this really kind of interesting nugget of information you've dug out. Yeah, and it's just a perfect story because it's like a classic hubris, yeah. human folly story that ends in sort of an epic, operatic, ridiculous, you know, destruction. <laughs> it does sort of like presage a lot of stuff that's happening in the world right now. Sure. Yes. A human being doing something that like ultimately down the line snowballs and proves to be completely like destructive to the natural world. A story like that is aesthetically more gripping than a story of like, we fixed the we fixed it sure <laughs> sure is that a thread that you feel like you could pull longer doing nonfiction in that way using a historical character as the the centerpiece to tell this sort of larger story about like it's well, something porcelino does well right he uses nature in that way yeah he was a big influence for sure i mean i can talk about what i'm my plans I, you know it's a terrible idea to talk about your plans sure. or what you're working on but i'll just go ahead and do it <laughs> Because <laughs> uh, it'll change or it'll evolve yeah. anyway. But at least right now, it's uh, yeah, it's a story with Glenn again walking through his neighborhood as he does in the beginning of this book. But this time, uh, I would bring in a lot of research about the town that he lives in. I grew up in a midwestern town in Illinois that you know had a history with immigrants and a history with farming, but then. It, you know, sort of became a suburb and had neighborhoods and, and you know, it's part of the Chicagoland area, so it's tied up in all the... Like white flight. The and, economics yeah. and the white flight and all that kind of stuff, too. And so um, reading a lot of books about small Midwestern towns and their, their histories, there's a lot of rich material there to weave into something. And so I'm reading those books and looking at that material and thinking about Glenn walking to the library again and seeing where that would take me. But reading, you know, like I could easily see like me reading a bunch of books about small Midwestern towns and then realizing that like Glenn maybe sees an earthworm or something and then like <laughs> actually the and the book ends up being about yeah. soil and earth, you know, it's so I'm open to yeah. following my nose, you know. That's kind of one of the built-in problems here and there, there's the issue of potentially running into a, a brick wall but then there's also the fact that like there are an infinite number of directions that you could possibly go in at any one time yeah and i i don't think there are i mean there are and there aren't i mean i think what happens is you find that i'll find that i end up writing about the thing that i kind of wanted to write about anyway meaning like if i want i've kind of been thinking about chlorophyll for a long time <laughs> right and <laughs> And I could see how, like, before I know it, that's what I'm actually writing yeah. about or researching. Why that specifically? What's so interesting about that? I don't know. It's one of those things. Got excited about it in science class in high school, and <laughs> I've, I've thought about it ever since. And then it's obviously very tied up in climate change and yeah. that as well. or just And breathing. I think about, you know, breathing is a, a big topic for meditators, and so breathing is involved in that. Um, do you meditate? Yeah. Is that a useful source of coming up with ideas? Sometimes. It's that thing of like trying to kind of get them out, but letting them flow through. It's maybe useful in the sense that what's not useful is to have a chattering mind all the time yeah. or chattering discursive mind. And quieting that is like what I was talking about earlier mm -hmm. about freeing up that creative mysterious part of your brain that might happen in meditation but it might not either meditation should not be turned into any kind of tool yeah i think i mean it obviously is a tool at one level but like the actual attitude or practice of it you can't go into it expecting that you're going to come out with ideas. no that's like the yeah yeah the dot-com story is an interesting one the way it leads in that direction because that that's something is that something that came from a real place for you? The story about these, um, I guess, I was going to say guys, because they are mostly guys playing yeah. a video game after hours. Was that an experience you had? Yeah. 
I worked at a company uh, in the early 2000s, and we played Quake, and we played Unreal after hours. I've talked to other people who say, no, we played them all day. Sure. <laughs> yeah. As though, as though we like... Never did, we were not that... Yeah, bold, we had a, brash. We, and we had a fair amount of work to do, so we did the work, and then we stay after hours and play quick and and then for years uh i played team fortress 2 as well for years and a lot of that ended up in the affected the story as well in some ways i think the story actually kind of prophesied what happened in when i played team fortress 2 later too meaning like after the story was done i was still playing team fortress 2 and i was like oh this is just like the story i wrote Meaning, I guess what I'm saying is, like, I pushed the story in one direction, and then I pushed that story in that direction farther than I, I had experienced, but then I experienced it later. I don't know. I don't play video games anymore, and I don't play those kind of video games anymore, and I, I, I talk about myself as being video game sober, and I, in general, I think it's one, it's super fun, but in general, I think it, was also a waste of time in many ways and i think i want to live my life in a different way i think that's one way to live your life but i i I don't want to live my life that way anymore and i think it had its its good sides and its bad sides it was it was addictive and addictive in part in for for good reasons and for bad reasons it was social it was social but (laughs) social ish yeah is social in a very like if there's a spectrum of sure social it's, it was it social was, but everyone's still in their own cubes with their own headsets on yeah it's yeah. social in the way that like facebook is social yes it's like an it's, electronic it's highly mediated conduit yeah social but i think that's an interesting example from the standpoint of the the path that that took you on was one that both touched on memoir in a way and also has an interesting historic context but like more immediate history you found a way to kind of touch on the dot-com bubble and just have that be a, a piece of the story yeah i think when i was writing that story i remember i was thinking um i like I've struggled for a long time about wanting to draw guns and violence and that kind of stuff, but not actually wanting to draw guns and violence. And so I thought, oh, drawing these people playing video games is a, kind of a backdoor into actually drawing guys running around with guns. So that was one thing. And then the other thing was I was thinking about uh, that whole experience and thinking about the Internet in general because I think those that was like 2000, 2001, and I had only had an email account mm-hmm. for four or five years at that point, and blogs were still in the future blog you know like uh, the, the internet has evolved a lot since then social social media was still in the future and so at the time too i was like what is the deal with the internet and i think using the the idea of the um the video game the multiplayer video game as sort of a little bit of a metaphor for what the internet ends up being too which is yeah like a highly mediated social space where people can play and be imaginative and creative, all the stuff that it that is actually positive about the internet. A lot of that went into that story as well. The capitalist corporate angle is the is the other angle is yeah. the, the dark side, I guess. But uh, that's the world we live in, I guess. Yeah, I think you touch on your own, as you said, the fact that you wanted to draw that but didn't want to draw what it represents. There's a bit of justification on Glenn's part where he's talking about how, you know, you realize that it's all just ones and zeros, you know, that that you can play this super gory video game because nobody's really getting hurt. Yeah, it's highly abstracted violence. Yeah. It's like actual violence and what that is is are very different things. It's really kind of like, I think I have Glenn saying like it's dots, like shooting dots at other dots. To which she counters, maybe there is some precedence here. Maybe, Maybe this is actually causing violence in the world. Yeah, yeah. I grappled with that in, in the story and in regular life, and I think ultimately those violent video games are, it's a mixed bag. They're not quite super harmful, but they're also not quite the best way to live one's life either. You know, I remember in college playing several hours of Grand Theft Auto and then walking out into the broad daylight and it kind of rewired my brain for a little bit. Oh, for sure. I think about yeah, I think about Grand Theft Auto all the time. I think I thought about it this weekend, just dry, you know, being in the taxi uh, and driving around uh, in Brooklyn. I was like, do I recognize some of this stuff from, what was it, Fort Grand Theft Auto oh, 4? God, okay, yeah. In your mind, you kind of make that jump of like, oh, I guess I can kind of see how people start to lose perspective after doing this for an extended period. Yeah, I mean, it's playing. It's playing a game. It's playing make-believe. And 
it's just like any kind of playing make believe if you it's actually healthy i think to make believe and to play very much so healthy but like anything it can it can shade into being unhealthy does storytelling scratch a similar itch yeah it's a sense of freedom and imagination and make believe and being able to go anywhere and do anything i think that's ultimately what i like about video games is that that initial sense of like this game is like a whole new world to explore yeah. and I can do all kinds of things. I can play around and, uh, playing around with comics and stories is the ultimate version of that where you can go all kinds of different directions. At the end of the book, you make a point to say that you're sleeping well. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. I think that's in part because I felt like people would ask that question. Yeah. I don't struggle with sleeping that much. I mean, I did for a time and I think the, there were normal reasons. It was like, I was drinking too much coffee. I was staying up too late. I was young. I wasn't eating right. I wasn't, you know what I mean? There's, mm -hmm. it's not really a mystery for most people, I think, sleeping problems. And some people have, some people have very serious sleep, sleeping problems, but I, I didn't. For me, it was, um, it was just a structure to, to hang a bunch of stories on. I mean, it does strike me that it comes from a real place that you've experienced that to some degree of at least like at the end of the day, going through all of the stupid shit that you've said in your life and all of the mistakes you've made. And yeah, I think it's definitely a universal experience. And that's part of the reason I was really attracted to it. And I'm attracted to, often attracted to something in a story when I'm like, oh, I think everybody goes through this yeah. thing. And then I think, well, what's, what is this thing like? What is the structure of this thing? And it feels like universal and classic. Not being able to sleep is for sure that. It must be a nice feeling when you, when you found that kind of peg that you can hang so much stuff on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's the sort of glowing idea that happens, and then you start thinking about arranging your life so that you can work on it. I think the experience in general of being awake at night is also a particular experience that is interesting. There's sort of a day world, and there's a night world, and there's sort of a day mind and a night mind. I used to stay up late and work, and then for many years, I got up early and worked, and now I'm sort of shifting back into staying up late and working. And so that's what I've been thinking about lately. That was a great Kevin Heizanga recorded that one in downtown Brooklyn. Hence the ambiance throughout. His new book, The River at Night, is out now on Drawn and Quarterly. Thanks to him and thanks to D&Q for setting up that conversation. Thanks to you, as always, for listening to the conversation. If you like the show, there are a number of ways to support us. You can rate and review us on iTunes. We're on Google Podcasts, Spotify. Just uploaded a bunch of new episodes to YouTube. Like us on Facebook. If you you have any feedback it's rolcast at gmail.com follow us on tumblr that's rolcast.tumblr.com that's the first and best place to get all of your riyl related information and that's about all i got for this week so stick around because we're going to be back just about this time next week with another episode of riyl